you got to to have a translator you got to reach out to them you got to try to understand the way that they see health the way that they see family the way that they see what are the values of their culture you're not going to be able to reach them unless you understand that same stuff here so culturally sensitive approach is is okay uh, it's a culturally sensitive approach to communicating with underrepresented populations suggests that crisis communication messages should be adopted by cataloging cultural characteristics of underrepresented groups to meet their crisis communication needs. So targeting certain communities using sort of the language of the, those communities. We all know that. But the final approach and the one we most prefer is the culture-centered approach. The culture-centered approach takes the culturally sensitive approach one step further by actually including underrepresented populations and preparing for and communicating about crises. How novel. Let's have the oppressed folks come in and talk. What are your problems? What are you dealing with? How, how novel, but unbelievably important. So, and there's, oddly, there's no set lesson here. Um, I think that should be a lesson, but I guess they sort of roll that into uh, some other stuff. Uh, but very, very important. A word on partnerships and listening. Page 46. Don't spin. You won't win. So again, there's a theme in this book about you don't want to manipulate the, the messages. Um, and they talk about that you must listen to all the various stakeholders, both primary and secondary public information sessions. Awesome. Like the forums I just talked about. Include opportunities for stakeholders to interact with key organizational representatives, examine posters about the crisis and response, recovery efforts, and collect additional information in the form of fact or Q&A sheets. But, you know, before and after, you got to meet with these folks. you got to have public information sessions. Um, for some reason, and this is what's really interesting, folks don't like to do this. Folks don't like to listen, particularly when they're bitching. But you got to listen when they're bitching. You get, it, get, you get my drift. For some reason, they say on the bottom of page 46, listening sessions are one of the processes organizations have the most difficulty adopting. In training sessions, we often explain that organizations should keep their friendly stakeholders close and their discontented stakeholders closer. However, many organizations feel compelled to distance aggravated stakeholders and communicate with and listen to only stakeholders with whom they are in agreement. This, in our opinion, is an ineffective business practice. Yeah. Bingo. Drop pipe. I don't want to break it. So, lesson five. Effective crisis communication involves listening to your stakeholders. Mm. Okay. Ah. Did it again. I'm, oops, I did it. I'm Britney Spears. Oops, I did it again. Right, Ben? Oh, you are my monkey. Come here. Next, what info do stakeholders need following a crisis? You want to know, Finn? Come here. lecture to us okay so there's lots of information uh there you go no he wants to yeah. you asked for finn you're getting finn okay what do stakeholders want to know but basically they just sort of have these lists of various ideas practical ideas communicate early and often with, it, with both internal and external stakeholders press conferences and all that type of stuff. Very, very important. Finn, very, very important. Um, got to, you know, even if there's no fresh news, you got to keep that communication open or else they think you're stonewalling. Always talk to them. Even say, we don't have any new information. We're just trying to let you know what we know. Right now, this is what we know. We're looking to find out something else, but you got to do that. Um, talks about identifying the cause of the crisis. Um, and know that the media and other folks, Finn, uh, are going to guess, even if, because sometimes you don't know what happened. What happened? I don't know. It, it's, it's a crisis. It's uncertain. We're trying to find out. Um, so you can't be defensive, but you got to go out there and say, we're searching, we're trying to figure it out. And maybe what these other folks are saying in various rooms, uh, cannot be at this point. 
then you are going crazy. Yeah. Fix that thing. Fix that crisis. Contact everyone affected by the crisis. Uh, contact them with compassion, concern, and empathy. Don't ignore them. When you know something's wrong, get out there and tell them. Save their lives. Don't make you, know, you don't want them to, to drink lead. Hopefully not. Uh, James Lee Witt uh, from FEMA says this. Not that I'm a huge fan of FEMA, but, well, FEMA had to, oh, wow. Well, we'll talk about Hurricane Katrina. You can empathize with their pain and embarrassment at being helpless. You can make adjustments to the recovery process based on their need for dignity. You can make sure they have shelter and a hot meal. You can listen to their stories and acknowledge their concerns. You can hug them and let them cry on your shoulder. You can say to them, as I do, we can't bring back your memories, but we can help you build new ones. So these are communication skills that he thinks are critical after a crisis. Compassion, concern, empathy, key components. Um, another thing that folks tend to want, um, effective, affected. Sorry, typo here. Uh, determine the current and future risks. Folks want to know about, you know, how are you going to fix this? And, and you know. Um, so, uh, you know, there's lots of different things uh, they talked about uh, here uh, so far as uh, you got to tell them that, you know, here's the risk for the future. Here's how we're trying to fix it. But basically, the, the, they say these within these four broad strategies for effective communication, there are also important communication approaches that need to be addressed. Uh, the role of certainty, and that's what they move here. But this is the, the four broad strategies we're trying to figure out what they are. Communicate early and often, both internally and externally. Try to identify the cause of the crisis. Let people know the cause of the crisis if you know it. But if you don't, make sure you're fighting against the rumors and you can say, we're, we're trying to figure it out. We don't know right now. That's okay. Uh, but don't spin. Don't be defensive. Um, that's, that's, that's bad. Contact everyone affected by the crisis. Do it. Determine the current and future risks. And then lesson six, which is what I just said. Communicate early about the crisis, acknowledge uncertainty, and assure the public that you will maintain contact with them about current and future risk. Very, very important. Is certain communication always the best approach? Uh, no. Duh. Um... A lot of folks say that, boom, you guys come out there, we know exactly what happened, blah, 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 blah. No. Uh, you do need a clear and consistent message out as fast as you can, but not too fast. Because, again, it needs to be clear and consistent. And what the book showcases, there are a lot of examples where folks quickly said stuff that was wrong. Oops. I did it again. That's the only Britney Spears song I think I know. No. What's that airplane thing? In any case. Um, and so there's lots of uh, uh, information here. Um, but it's really, really important that we don't, you know, you have to have some ambiguity. You have to showcase uncertainty. You can't come out and say with absolutes. You can't, re can't over-reassure the public, particularly when you don't know what's going on. Um, I like the, well, they had some deets explained, uh, the flu virus. Uh, the results are encouraging, but unfortunately, they're still not the conclusive proof we need to fully discount the human the possibility of human, human transmission, blah, blah, blah. Uh, conversely, when asked if the bird flu had spread to Thailand, Thai prime minister said it's not a big deal. If it's bird flu, if it's bird flu, we can handle it. We have been working very hard. Please trust the government, blah, blah. That's bad. So don't over reassure folks at times because accurate information is not always available it is justifiable to say we do not know that's good so lesson seven avoid certain or absolute answers to the public and media until sufficient information is available which is the next section where it says be careful of over reassuring your stakeholders so, yeah. Here's the thing. This is a little bit counterintuitive. You think if you're going to, you know, uh, say, hear the stuff, you know, folks are going to go all crazy. 
basically the, the thing is a, a lot of folks don't want to get information out there even if it's accurate or whatever because they think there's going to be a big panic. That ain't it. That, that's, that's wrong. <laughs> folks ain't going to go all crazy unless the UFOs attack. If there are saucers, flying saucers in the sky, yeah, people are going to go nuts. Um, I, if the aliens attacked, I would go to Applebee's and then try to get kicked out of an Applebee's. I don't think I'd get kicked out of an Applebee's during an alien invasion. Um, but basically, uh, same stuff. Uh, most panics actually come from inconsistent messaging. We thought it was this. Oh, now we say it's this. Now it's this. Da, da, da. That's what causes panic. So, lesson eight. Do not over-reassure stakeholders about the impact the crisis will have on them. That's important. Um, because if you do re over-reassure... When the public believes they cannot trust those in authority or the information is being hidden from them, the level of perceived threat is likely to increase substantially. As an organization, you want folks to trust you. You can't deal with a crisis effectively if, if they don't trust you. Okay. Tell your stakeholders how to protect themselves. Messages should focus on self-efficacy. What can you do to protect yourself? Don't drink the water. Don't take the Tylenol. Don't take two and call me in the morning. Don't take three. Anderson three. Do they, does that still exist? Don't do it. Tell them. Tell them what they can do to, to, to protect themselves. And sometimes then you will get them to, to help themselves and thus help fight the larger crisis. Um, that's really, really important. And so, uh, and then again, the counterintuitive thing. Um... I thought it was pretty interesting. Uh, da, 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 where does it say that? Uh, information suggests communication get minimum, middle, and maximum responses. Blah, blah, blah. Uh, da, 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 North Dakota flood. We suggest 51, page 50. A counterintuitive approach to crisis communication. Rather than immediately responding to questions concerning a crisis with certainty to prevent the public from panicking, we advocate that due to the uncertainty of crisis, the organization's communication should carry with it a level of ambiguity or uncertainty. Thus, lesson nine, the public needs useful and practical statements of self-efficacy during a crisis. Tell them what they can do to protect themselves, even if you do not know what's going on. Hopefully you will find out pretty quickly. But don't over-reassure. You can show some ambiguity you can say, we are uncertain what's going on right now. The best thing that you can do, though, is don't drink the water. Don't eat that burrito. We don't know exactly what's going on right now. People have gotten sick. Don't eat the burritos. Tacos? Ah, no burritos. Actually, if we really just really know, you can eat corn. Okay, um, next thing, chips, corn chips. Reducing and intensifying uncertainty before, during, and after organizational crisis. Um, and basically, this is on the bottom of page 51, they talk about all this research that has been out there, um, and I'm going to go through this pretty quickly, but basically, from the research they have gathered, they are telling us as readers here, here are some cool things to do before a crisis, Here's some bad things to do before a crisis. Here's some cool things to do during crisis. Here's some bad things. Good things post-crisis, bad things. So, here are keys for pre-crisis. Strong positive leadership values and goals. Ooh. Open and honest communication with stakeholders. Ooh. A commitment to stakeholders and developing a reservoir of goodwill. Ooh. Go team. Sort of self-explanatory and stuff that's tied to all the things that we've talked about, particularly in the ethics chapter and then the previous stuff in this particular chapter. Predictors of ineffective pre-crisis calm. Poor communication relationships with stakeholders. That's bad. 
Distance from aggravated stakeholders. Bad. Keep enemies close. Have some.